Hello, and as we are continuing on our Old Testament uh, class, this is uh, number 21, and taking a break because somebody asked a very interesting question. The problem is some answers aren't answered quickly. So I'm going to start now and get as far as I can into it. And the question is about how historical or should we look upon the Bible as being a historical work? Well, the first thing we need to do is define what is history. Now there's history and there is, is historiography. History is the events that took place in the past. Historiography is the writing about it. And um, to ask whether a book is historical or not is a complex question then. Because it could refer to the intentions of the author in terms of giving the details. And that way, in a success in achieving his intention or the intention of being historical. When we identify historical books as a genre, you know, we talked about that in the very beginning, we are asserting the author's intent is to be an antiquarian. In other words, to tell us of the past. And the narrative presents what the author supposes to have happened in space and time in the past. Now see, if he had lived in the past and he had wrote down these events immediately, then it would be real history. But that never happens, even in terms like the New Testament. They were written much later because when they were written when people thought they needed to write things down. So the author's intention is to give the key events of the past. Now, we have to go a little bit further. A book intended to be historical, but not as a history textbook, you know, because are they really just telling what happened, or are they giving a commentary with it? Um, because, you know, this isn't a videotape uh, presentation. And it involves a historian. The historian takes part in the story. Uh, and we'll see exactly how what part that he takes. Um, history tries to impose a coherence of the past. Now, for those of us living in 2020, and you know this is a really confusing time in which to live. How are historians going to deal with all these issues? They're going to try to make sense out of the events. And we who are living in it are having trouble making sense out of those same events as we uh, live through them. Uh, all history writing, therefore, is written from a perspective. And if it's written from a perspective, you know, because you can't be every place all the time, you, you have to, uh, to give some a coherence, you have to be somewhat subjective. You decide, the historian decides, uh, the shape of the material and what is going to be uh, communicated. The subjectivity involved in a historical narrative does not invalidate the historical intention. Some skeptics want to, want to do that. But it is absolutely impossible to write objective history. Even if you said, oh, he picked up a mask. Well, there's a lot of things. Did I pick it up with my right hand, my left hand? Are you going to eliminate information? that you consider not to be important. But a left-handed person might consider it important that my left hand could have been my dominant hand. And why am I picking up a mask? 
and all kinds of questions involved. So, there is perspective. Biblical history does have the antiquarian interest. We really want to know what occurred. The author or authors of the Pentateuch believe that God actually created the universe in the past. Abraham migrated from Mesopotamia to Palestine. Moses actually parted the Red Sea. David ascended the throne of Israel. The kingdom was divided under Solomon's son. The Babylonians defeated the Israelites. And Ezra and Nehemiah led a reform in the post-exil community. That was what they had as their facts that everything was going to go flowing from. However, the historicity of these acts is assumed in that they are stated and not proved. Yes, we stepped foot on the moon, did we? Or was it really a movie? And but they believed, you know, Moses parted the Red Sea. Whether it happened or not is not the issue here. It's the fact that they believed that it happened exactly as it was described. And they believed in these particular people. But rather to impress the, um, they're not trying to talk history, they're trying to impress the reader with the theological significance of these acts. That's more important than the his historicity, the actual history of the events. They tell these things, they have picked these things because of the theological impact. And so history and theology are closely connected in the biblical text. Indeed, biblical history, as we've been saying, is not objective history. That is uninterpreted. It is filled with interpretation. History is narrated because it has a divine purpose. For this reason, commentators have referred to biblical history as theological history, prophetic history, a covenantial history. The covenantial history is probably the most appealing because covenant is the primary divine and human relationship metaphor used in the Bible. And the Bible charts this relationship from the time of Adam and Eve in Genesis through the consummation of the world in the book of Revelation for Christians. Moreover, we must explore the relationship between history and fiction especially in the light of the works of scholars such as Alter in 1981, who tended to kind of mix the two together. He observes the literary, he calls it the Bible, fictional history. And Long in 94 points out, fictionality is possible but a misleading category for biblical historiography. Since after all, an account of something is not literally that something. It's kind of like what you see on television. Uh, this is what they're saying. A docudrama. In other words, and you see it especially with biblical works, uh, even going back to the famous movie of the Ten Commandments. Uh, how do you fill in the gaps? Well, you add some fiction in there. And these authors kind of figure, well, that's what the biblical authors did. They had these little facts, and they expanded them for interesting reading, and kind of bordering on fiction, or fictionalized them. Now, so this brings the question about of historicity. It is important, or is it important, that's where you're coming from, uh, that these events actually took place in space and time. Did Moses stand at the Red Sea and the waters part? Did, he? Did that really happen? And Ramsey, another biblical scholar, uh, 
points out another question that kind of brings it in perspective. If Jericho, remember the city of Jericho, falling on the horns, is not raised, is our faith in vain? If this historical fact did not occur, does everything collapse? Now, we're kind of lured into, uh, Ramji's doing this deliberately, a simplistic answer. The destruction of Jericho has no direct bearing on a Christian's faith in Jesus Christ, and mm, even le less context for the Jews' faith, because that's not where it is. Nonetheless, indirectly, the question is crucial. It certainly raises the issue of epistemological basis of our faith, you know, being based in words. Uh, many people, even modern people, will agree with Paul when he says, if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. 1 Corinthians 15. Our knowledge of the resurrection comes from the Bible. It purports to be God's word. Thus, it's trustworthy. The Gospels present themselves as historical, though, not denying, being theological and somewhat artistic. The accounts of the resurrection. The book of Joshua as an example of an Old Testament historical book also presents itself as an account of the past acts of God to save his people. See the similarity there. On what basis besides arbitrary modern sensibilities and desires would we accept the teaching of the gospel and reject the teaching of Joshua? Yes, we're biased. Then if, we, if you're going to res accept Joshua, you got to accept the resurrection, and the opposite is also true. Thus, to suspect or reject the historical uh, historicity of the raising of Jericho does indeed raise an obstacle to faith. We're questioning the book. The historicity of the historical books of the Old Testament is important because the Bible makes numerous claims. And see, Christians have a tendency I, I put, put this, to push away, oh, the Old Testament, that's not important. No, it is very important, as we've seen by looking at the perspective, the big picture. If, you know, these covenants didn't set the groundwork for Jesus and what he did, then, well, what did he do? And so these, the historicity of these historical books is important because the Bible makes these numerous claims explicitly sometimes, implying them implicitly in others, concerning the factuality of the events it records. As the most fundamental level, the central core of Christian beliefs is the fact that Christ did indeed die for the sins of humanity and then rose from the dead in a great victory over death. This focus, the ground and basis of our faith. And it's based in an understanding of Jesus found in the Hebrew Scriptures. Okay. Now, going on. History and the supernatural. A major issue as one approaches the subject of history in the Bible is the occurrence of supernatural events. And that means the person who's writing is going to have some presuppositions and those presuppositions are going to come to the forefront. In the Hebrew Scriptures, one reads that there was a bush and that bush burned, but it was not destroyed. There is also a donkey that speaks, dead people who live again, seas that part, the sun stopping in the middle of the sky, and more. If an interpreter approaches the Hebrew Scriptures 
as he would any other book. That is, if he perceives it is written from a human vantage point about human affairs, skepticism is warranted. However, a second interpreter who admits to the reality of God. Remember the first one there? Uh, you know, doesn't believe in the supernatural, so all of this stuff out there. But a second interpreter who is a, say, a faith-filled person who admits to the reality of God and who believes that God is the ultimate authority and the guiding voice of the Bible will not have any difficulty in accepting the supernatural events of the Bible. This, of course, is where the dialogue between conservative and critical scholars gets stalled. Nonetheless, conservatives must guard against the tendency to over-historicize the Bible. Legitimate genre questions must be addressed in the interpretation of certain books. Why are there differences between the narration of the same events and Samuel King's over against Chronicles? What is the historical kernel of the Job story? Is Jonah history or a parable? These kinds of issues should be recognized and addressed. So, in the 1990s, we saw the rise of a growing skepticism concerning the possibility of actual history and that, you know, getting the history from the Hebrew Bible. Such authors as Davies, Thompson, etc., uh, among others, have, despite their differences, come to be regarded as a school of thought that is commonly referred to as minimalism. And basically, what you do in minimalism is you take the Hebrew Scripture story and what things can you verify from other sources? You take those little bits of pieces, and that's your history. And you accept some other things that um, to have point something that's verified outside of history, and but could only occur if such and such a thing occurred before. Okay, we'll add that to it. And so, the problem is, since historical evidence is rare, and uh, realistically, you, know, you really can't find anything, uh, and the minimalists even go to extreme of casting doubt on direct evidence that exists. Uh, the David inscription, the Meridipa, uh, uh, Stella, and so forth, in other words, um, well, yeah, it could be, could be something else, and so let's reject it. And so they becomes they, they kind of propose something, a more objective way of reconstructing the history of Palestine. Nevertheless, let's do everything based upon archaeology. And archaeologists tell us <laughs> that's one piece of the puzzle. The wholesale skepticalism, skepticism of the millennialist is hardly justified and has received significant negative critique. But elements of it remain in a lot of biblical scholars. You know, they'll say, well, we can't say that happened because, you know, there's not this other evidence. Uh, the nature of biblical historiography. Biblical history, as we've been saying, is not an objective reporting of purely human events. It is an impassioned account of God's acts in history as he works in the world to save his people. And I think a key element, it's impassioned. I mean, the author wrote it for a reason. I mean, he's not writing fiction to make money. He's writing something that he really believes in He's passionate about and he wants you to know about it. So, since it's about God, it's theological, it's prophetic, and it's covenant history. 
Now, that means you have some of these other tools or negative things. One is called selectivity. No history can tell everything about the subject. I mean, even like writing about 2020, even your own experience of 2020, could you write down every everything that occurred to you? No. So you select certain things based upon your own criteria. Uh, because it would actually take longer to write what happened than it actually did for it to happen. And so, uh, you know, a historian's goal is a little bit more comprehensive into what's, but he makes a decision, or she, into what's included and what's excluded. So if you look at the history of David's reign in Samuel King's, and in Chronicles, you see what the point is. In Samuel Kings, there is a long narrative about David's sin with Bathsheba and her later role in the transition of the kingship to Solomon. So, 2 Samuel 11, 1 Kings 1. But no mention of Bathsheba in the Chronicles except in the genealogy. One picked to include, one picked to exclude. But selectivity is not only a necessity of space, but also a part of the function and intent of a historiographer. The biblical historian is not interested in even in every aspect of the past, but focuses on the community of Israel which is often represented by the king as a corporate personality. And although the community interests often find expression in the political and military life of the people of God, the historical books of the Old Testament are not interested in politics for its own sake, but only in how politics and military action affect Israel's relationship with God. That covenant behind everything. That's why we spent all that time looking at this covenant. Because it colors the views of everyone putting together the Hebrew Scriptures. One of the keys to proper interpretation of biblical historical books is the discovery of the writer's intentions and how they affect their principle of selectivity. Illustrate that. Uh, not exhaustively, by comparing Samuel King's and Chronicles. Samuel King's emphasizes the sins of the kings of both Israel and Judah, particularly their rejection of the law of centralization. The role of the prophets is emphasized as God delayed retribution. The evidence indicates an exact date for this book and an intention to answer the question, why are we God's favorite people in exile? So, for example, it fits the purpose of the historian to include Bathsheba account, which highlights David's sins. Chronicles, on the other hand, focuses on Judah alone, minimalizes the sins of the kings, and asks the questions of Judah's historical continuity with the past. There is also an emphasis in reporting on the temple, where we discover that the time of the composition of the historical work is the restoration period. We see that its principle of selectivity is driven by different questions. What are we to do now that we are back in the land? And what is our connection to Israel of the past? Selectivity. Next area is emphasis. Closely connected, but not all acts of God, not everything that occurred to Israel was equally important to the biblical historians. Some events are emphasized over others. This emphasis often supports the intention of the book in a way similar to that of the principle of selectivity. For instance, 
The emphasis on the temple and chronicles, in contrast to Samuel King's, arises in part, at least, because of the fact that the temple was being rebuilt at the time. Thus, through the use of emphasis and the drawing analogies with the past, the chronicler shows the continuity between the people of God at the end of the period of the Hebrew Scriptures and the people of God at the time of Moses and David. But sometimes emphasis serves other more didactic purposes. Of the many cities that were overrun at the time of the conquest, two stand out in the narrative in terms of emphasis, Jericho and Ai. These are emphasized because they are first, but also because they are a paradigm for the proper waging of a holy war. The lesson of Jericho in Joshua 6 is that obedience to the Lord results in victory. While the lesson of I in Joshua 7 is that disobedience, even by a single individual, will grind conquest to a halt. Next area, order. For the most part, biblical history follows a roughly chronological order. Much of it rehearses the history of Israel under the reigns of its various kings. However, chronology is not a straitjacket as can be observed in a number of places in the narration where the thematic concerns take precedence. For instance, 1 Samuel 16 recounts David's early service to Saul as the musician whose gift soothed Saul's tormented soul. The following chapters introduce David a second time as the one who defeats Goliath. The problem with the latter story is that when David is presented to Saul, the king does not recognize him. 1758. This would be strange if he'd been serving in Saul's court for a period of time. A probable explanation of this anomaly is that the text is not focused on chronological reporting, but intends rather a dual topic, dual tropical, in, topical introduction of David was a young man already manifested the gifts that would gain him renown as the sweet psalm singer of Israel as well as the mighty warrior of the Lord. Next thing. Application. I've already commented that biblical historians make no attempt to be dispassionate. They are not modern historians seeking the brute facts of history. On the contrary, they are prophets who mediated God's word to his people. They are vehicles of God's interpretation of his holy acts. As a matter of fact, it is not misleading to envision the historians of Israel as preachers. Their texts are the event. Like our preacher today, their texts are the scripture. They apply them with zeal to the congregation of Israel. These texts are wonderful integration of history, literature, morality, and theology. Okay, so did that answer the question about looking at the Bible as a history book? Hopefully you got the answer. Well, kind of not. And, but there's a lot of good history in there. And it was protected by these authors. But the more important thing is that they wanted you to know that God was involved in the history of the world and that God will continue to be involved in the history of his people and that he has a goal. And that goal is salvation. all the way through the big picture from Adam to the prophets and Christians in on the eternal covenant of the new covenant with Jesus the big picture the big pictorial elements that are historical are there and they are believed to be historical 
Others may question the reality, but the authors do not question that Moses parted the Red Sea. They do not question David and Solomon. These are the facts that were passed on to them and they are passing on to us. So we have confidence in them and we take what they say to be the best that they knew. And you can look at it ourselves today as I always point out the one example of um, is the earth round. And most students will tell me, oh yes. And I said, well, prove it. And they go, well, I've seen a picture of the earth from space. And I point out how good, you know, could NASA be, you know, to fool us. As a matter of fact, they've been accused of, you know, the moon landing didn't really occur. And they made a movie, Capricorn One, about the same kind of idea that they put together a show because uh, they had lots of money to do it. And you look at Star Trek, so, you know, gee, all of that looks realistic, even though we know it's all special effects. Sorry, going off on a tangent. So, what other ways do you have to prove that the world is round? Has anybody gone around it? And then you go ahead, story, well, you know, uh, Christopher Columbus, well, he only went part way. Or, you know, you could fly from uh, around the Earth. And I said, well, not really, because, you know, if, you, if the Earth is a plate, you could fly around that way and say, you've gone around the Earth. And you see, most people don't look into those things for themselves. The answer is very simple. Just go to the shore. If you see a boat coming in, if the earth is flat, you'll see the whole boat at the same time. But when you see the mast and the, you know, all coming in, it means that the earth is curved. Now, you've accepted that the earth is round because that's what you've been taught and everybody seems to hold the same thing. And so that's what these authors do. They believe these things to be true and they'll bet their lives on them because that's the experience that they have. So I'll leave you on that note and answering of that question. So if you have any other questions, please feel free to contact me at Jonathan, J-O-N-A-T-H-A-N dot M-O-R-S-E at V-A dot gov. If you're at Prairie Point, you can just call the operator and ask for me, or you can stop by my office at C-105 in the Chapel Building. And uh, if you have any other questions, that's what I'm here for. And um, we'll come up with some new material for next week. We may be having, I'm waiting to see how things are going to be changing, so we may have some changes coming in the future to all our programming here on Channel 6. So if you like something on Channel 6, uh, send me an email. If there's something that you would like to see added, send me an email. If there's something you don't like, send me an email. And I will put those all together for the people who are determining the future of Channel 6 here at Prairie Point. So may God bless you and keep you.